chat GPT or any other software, it's, it's kind of, you have to know the right parameters put in. If you're not educated and you don't know what parameters put in, you're not going to get the right financial plan. And I think this comes back to my next question is, what do you think is the most critical financial literacy, literacy gaps amongst Canadians today? Welcome back to the Wealth Easy Show, where we talk all things wealth, health, and real estate. My guest today has been in the life insurance industry for nearly three decades, working in advanced tax and estate planning. He's awarded the President's Award in 2022 for building the corporate coaching program with Equitable Life. He's been vice president with an MGA and now is vice president of sales for Desjardins Insurance for Ontario and Atlantic Canada. Please welcome to the show, Brent Swatek. Welcome, Brent. Thanks so much. Thank you for being here. I know that we both have similar uh, relationships in the insurance industry. We've both been in the industry for nearly three decades. You've been a little bit longer. Give us a little bit of a two-minute bio on the history of yourself and and your, the role that you've been playing in the insurance industry for uh, like 27 years now. Yeah. Uh, so history obviously started back in 97 in field sales with a career company. Realized that that wasn't really for me. So I, I, I took my leave and I went into the brokerage market space and got into group developing some product Ended up at an MGA running their trust department and ended up uh, running their uh, advanced planning department. Uh, I was fortunate that Candle Life came along and liberated me and took me up there for a good while. Got to work on teams. and got to work on some really cool projects. Uh, and then around 2017, there was a big merger, and that presented an opportunity for me to make a depart from that company. Went over to Equitable, who was starting to get into that space, uh, was able to help establish a team over there and really do some great things uh, under that banner. Uh, and then once again, we hit a bit of a change, a bit of a change in direction. And that led to a catalyst to say, maybe it's time for me to change and grow and move on. So I went to this uh, great MGA uh, boutique, sort of Southern Ontario major player and uh, spent the last year and a half there. It was great. And then Desjardins came along and had a great, uh, great mission. Uh, and I just really, you know what, I was at the point where I was like, you know what, I think this is where I'm supposed to be. So mm -hmm. jump ship went over there. A, lo a lot of what I do is a lot of what I've done, my body of work, has really been advisor to advisor. So meaning you have a client, uh, you're working on a case, and you just want something, somebody to bounce that case around with you. Or, you, you know, some advisors may not have that experience. So I have a mm -hmm. lot of at-bats sitting in front of clients, uh, very wealthy clients, and helping them get clear on what the mission is. And then from there, helping them solve the problems that they have. Yeah, so I mean, <clears throat> with with my MGA, if if I have a an advanced case uh, or a tax issue, I have advanced people within my MGA that I'll go to say, hey, I need some help on this. Or if I feel that I have a, a high net worth client that says, hey, I'm going to have my accountant there, I'll bring them along with me. That's kind of the role that you're playing with this MGA also. Yes? Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and with, uh, and with uh, the carrier before that, same sort of thing. So when I was at the carrier, obviously, I'm, I, although I've never really played the, the the maybe the good soldier of, you know, only sell our product. I'd look at cases and I'd be like, listen, John, I love you, but I wouldn't do this case with us. Like, I think this case works better with Sun Life or works better with whomever. Because ultimately, my philosophy, my philosophy has always been I might I might be able to squeeze one case out of you. But once you've realized that I've led you astray, well, we're probably never going to do business again. So. Uh, all the carriers I worked with knew that I was like that because they'd be like, yeah, listen, I, I think this is the right company because mm -hmm. because of X, Y, Z, because that fits your client better. Um, and I always found that was just a really good way to do business because I always found that when I helped you do a case with Sun Life, then you wanted to find a case that would fit with us because you're like, hey, I, I've got to make sure you get paid. I've got to make sure that, you know, the that the uh, ledger's balanced, right? So, so yeah. You're the go-to guy. You you know your shit. <laughs> I, oh, I, yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, I, do you know Jim Ruda? Are you familiar with Jim Ruda? Yes, I know Jim Ruda. Yeah, yeah. okay. I figured as much. Yeah. But uh, Jim Ruda used to, he had a line where he'd say, uh, know, your, know your stuff, know what you're stuffing and stuff it, right? So I know a lot of stuff. I have a lot of resources, which is great. A lot of uh, tax lawyers, tax accountants, actuarial friends and whatnot. So 
if I don't know the answer, I, you know, it's, it's like six degrees of separation sort of thing. It's not too far, not too far away to find the answer. And, uh, honestly, I, I'm usually not the smartest guy in any of the rooms that I'm sitting in. So just very resourceful mm -hmm. on making sure that we get what we need to make sure clients are in the best position. So why insurance? Why not wealth management or go with like a broker and become, you know, what I did for 17 years and, gather assets mm -hmm. and be a financial advisor? Why insurance? It's a good question. Um, so my father was in insurance prior. So my father worked. Mine too. Le oh, yeah. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a fact I did not know. Um, well, my new biological father that I recently discovered, because oh. you, you know the whole story, yeah. changing from Durbano to Maguire. So recently discovered my birth father, my biological father um, was in the insurance business. Oh. And hence, um, I was given this ring by my stepmother um, that he was given when he, uh, 1990, when he uh, became MDRT. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, so now I wear my father's insurance ring. So it's pretty crazy how, how um, you know, genes and, uh, you know, the, the, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Yeah, so, yeah. so I didn't mean to interrupt you. But no, no, yeah, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy story how I just recently discovered that my father was in the insurance business too. And I'm like, that's crazy. DNA is just... It's yeah, so yeah. bang on. It's it, it is it is rather funny um, how that happened. So for me, honestly, I had no intention of coming in this business. I, I knew my father worked hard. He was gone a lot, and he, and and he was always working. And he's always the type of guy that if you called him, he'd he'd drive across town. Like whether it was a two hundred dollar monthly deposit into some investment, or um, you know, it was a form that could have been mailed in. But my father just was of that old school, like. Personal COVID, attention. COVID would have changed a lot of that, I know. <laughs> yeah. And he would have had to adopt. Yeah. Um, so for me, I, I I remember I was working in a company uh, and I got, I was very young and I, and I got passed over twice. Like somebody stood up and took credit for something I had figured out and fixed in the company I was with. And I, I, I was just frustrated by it. I was just like, you know what? So I remember my uh, dad counseling somebody else once like hey there's this test you take and they determine whether you're a fit for the business and I I probably shocked him but I called him up and said hey I want to take that test uh like call your manager guy and tell him I'm going to come down and see him and I'll take the test so anyways I take the test I come in I, I'm absolutely uh I couldn't speak to people like I I stammered I, I mumbled a lot I, I I had like stage fright even though I had been on stages in high school this was different like this was like mm -hmm. I, I wasn't playing for like it wasn't a play like I was playing with people's finances and futures here so you know the, the first meeting I did, I think I stared at my manager the entire meeting. I don't even think I talked to the people. I think I talked directly to him. And, uh, you know, lo and behold, I, so I got investment licensed. I thought that was maybe the way to go. Um, I got in. I started. I, I was doing okay. I could gather assets and, and whatnot. Um, it, but I, it just didn't fit with me. So, like, insurance kind of – insurance made sense to me. And in the beginning, it was living benefits. So I was mainly going out and talking DI with people, and I was talking group because I, accounting seems to make sense in my head, like debits and credits and things balancing out. And group is very accounting focused, right? Mm -hmm. So I went out and I did I did that for a while, and then um, I just started getting. I had some mentors. They have no idea why they talked to me because I I was really not in their sphere, their level, whatever you want to say. Um, but they would show me things, and I would, like I'm inquisitive, so I want to know how things kind of work, and then. Um, yeah, I just started picking into the, uh, advanced case space and little by little bit by bit and getting into the, uh, carrier side of the business. There was such a big need for it. Advisors wanting to know, like, how do I open? Like, I know this guy, but how do I open with him? Like, how do I, how would I open up that sale? And, uh, or, you know, what do I do once I get in front of them? Like I can get in front of them, but what do I do once in there? Um, and so it just led me down like a whole trail of like learning uh, and then I just realized there's tons of money, folks. There's not as many insurance folks. Mm -hmm. There's even less advanced case insurance folks, like people that are focused on business owners, people with real wealth. Uh, how do you work with their existing advisors? How do you work with their family offices? How do you work? You know, like, how does all this come together? And where's our role? And how do we fit into this? So that just intrigued me. And you know, I spent probably 18 years solely working with uh, pretty much every deal day was uh, working with some business mm -hmm. on uh, some business owner on some uh, 
you know, issues, whether it's buy sell agreements or succession or, uh, you know, startups where they're, they, they, they've signed a whole bunch of personal guarantees and, you know, it's just dawned on them. Like they're, they're not sleeping at night because they realize if this fails, like the house is tied to this, like my family's, I've risked everything for it. So, you know, taking away some of those burdens and letting them focus on just doing business. That's, that's always been like, it's, it's just intriguing to me. I think it's just more intriguing maybe than the money side. I'm not saying anything against money people. You want to do money, that's totally mm-hmm. cool. The other side of the equation is, I, I will tell you, this has been a big uh, amount of talks and catalyst over the last while was the amount of folks that, uh, the amount of money folks that are just focused on accumulation. Mm-hmm. They have no idea about deaccumulation. And, and quite frankly, deaccumulation is kind of a bad word in a lot of their in a lot of their houses because they get, if, if you work for certain institutions, you, you have to, you start out the year with a hundred million and you got to be at 115, you know, doesn't matter how many redemptions happened along the way, this is what they need. So mm-hmm. it's not, it's not really in their best interest to teach you actually how to access your money. And so uh, a couple of, a couple short years ago, two years ago, we found uh, my, my wife's aunt passed and it was funny because like a couple months before that, she ended up uh, falling and hurting herself and, she was telling us that she was worried she's kind of running out of money. And I thought, that's crazy. Like, I know what you're retired with. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, two things that came out of that. Number one, you know, they're saying you're the sum of your five best friends. Well, yep. when you retire, when you hang around old people that are running out of money and they have ailments, you may not have that exact experience, but you will start to become the sum of your five best friends. So be careful with who you choose to hang around with. The second thing, too, is they were all going broke. So she was convinced she was going broke. Mm. But after she passed, what we found as executors, she was still accumulating. She had a growing non-registered and a maxed out TFSA that was going on every year. But she was afraid she was running out of money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that said to me, like, we do such a good job on getting people conditioned to go up the front side of the mountain, which I know you'll know that reference. Oh, yeah. Uh, But we do such a bad job on getting them to understand how to get down the mountain safely and 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 how to spend and enjoy your life. That's the most dangerous part. It's the most dangerous, you know what? And you know this as well, but uh, I mean, the majority of deaths that, like there's the stat within our community, which is the majority of deaths coming are on the descent of Everest, not so much on the ascent of Everest. So um, there's so, it's just, just such an intriguing side of the business. Hey everyone, it's John. I just wanted to thank you for being here and I would ask that you please subscribe to the show by just clicking the subscribe button right here. I'd really appreciate it. It helps grow the show so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. If you're already subscribed, a huge thank you. When you subscribe, you're gonna get access to the program before anybody else does. So if you would, just click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. And welcome back to the Wealth Easy Show. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree with you more. And that's one of the biggest reasons why I left the money side of the business is because I finally realized after 17 years of being the asset gatherer and telling my clients to max out your RSPs, max out your TFSA, save, save, save. Saving is not the right way to go because money guys... Um, their philosophy is save, then spend, and then pray. Pray you don't run out of money. Right. Because their theory is build this large retirement account and live off 4%. Right. And the, the, the 4% is the safe withdrawal rate so that you don't run out of money. So in theory, you could end up retiring on much less than what you have been living on because let's say for example you know the average right now the average canadian is retiring with about two hundred and sixty six thousand dollars in their rsps which is not going to get you anything okay let's say let's 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 bump it up let's say you had a million dollars and you know this they're going to tell you if you've been accustomed to living on say 80 or a hundred thousand dollars a year they're going to say you don't want to run out of money so only spend 4%. So now you've just taken a massive pay cut. Now you live on 40,000. What happens in the following year if you lose 20% in the markets? Mm-hmm. Now you're down to 800,000 and now you got to live on 4%. So you just took a pay cut of 30. So you, you saved all these years, you live through scarcity, you now get to spend it, which is now you're coming down the mountain like you say, but now you got to pray that you don't run out of money. 
And now you've, you've li you're living through scarcity again. What I love about the insurance side is that it's guaranteed and it will meet those needs. It's, it'll give you the permission slip to spend all of the money and then have it all replaced. Yeah. And what I like about, well, no, what I like, what I love about insurance is that it plays the main character in every financial plan. Because maximum financial potential is the sum of maximum money supply plus maximum benefits equals the maximum financial potential. If you take a look at money, you might get the maximum money supply, but you never get the maximum benefits. Never. Insurance does both. Right. So all of these other things, you know, your TFSAs, your RSPs, your non-reg, all these things, real estate, all these other things, I think, play a supporting character role, but insurance must be the main character. I think you referenced it as the heart, right? The it's heart. the heart. It is right. the heart of every financial plan. Right. And that's what I love about it because it's guaranteed to pay out. Right. As long as you make your premium payments, it's guaranteed to fulfill its obligations. Yeah. And, and it's funny how people's, uh, so like I, I'm a big fan of behavioral finance. Um, and it, it's funny if we could get more people to see this earlier. Like yeah. if you could see this in your 40s, the, the, the accessibility or mobilization of your money that you could have in your retirement would be insane. But the problem is it's, it's your mindset. Now I'll give you an, I'll give you, this is like a per, like totally personal example. Cause it's my parents. Yes. So my parents did not grow up. I did not grow up with wealthy, like a wealthy background. My, my great grandfather was an immigrant from Russia, uh, you know, survived, had a bunch of kids, uh, you know, they didn't grow up well. And my mom's side, probably even less than my father's side, but my parents did well. So they, they were, they were motivated. They are everything the Canadian dream should be, right? They were motivated. They worked hard. They did well. And what they instilled in us is what they instill with every, every like family from that generation for the most part, if you didn't, if you grew up middle class anyways, um, is work hard, like study hard, get a good job, save well, because everything I've acquired, I intend to use in my lifetime. And on the day that my father used to say on the day I die, I will spend the last dollar. Mm -hmm. So like there's nobody coming to save you. And it was a great, uh, it's a bad message, but it's a great message too, right? It's a great message from the standpoint of don't, don't rely on me, do for yourself. So that's always kept my sister and I very hungry and going. Now, the interesting thing was my dad retired early. My dad retired before the age of 60. He just had had enough. He had worked really hard. He had enough saved. What, what was interesting was his psychology. So this was a very comfortable risk taker uh, for most of his life. Now, most of the risks he took were known risks to him. So that's why he was comfortable taking mm -hmm. them. But he retires. And uh, first year, no travel. Second year, no travel. Third year, no travel. And they had talked about traveling. So my sister, and they moved like three hours away. So my sister says, Brian, you need to go see them. So that, mean, that means I take the trek down the 401 to go see them. And we're talking. I'm like, so what gives? Like, what's going on? I know what you have. I used to manage it. I go, like, what's going on? Well, we're afraid that if we get some bad markets uh, or we get ill, we may run out of money. And there's a certain amount of money that your mother and I would leave, would like to leave for your sister and you that we're afraid that if we do a whole bunch of stuff too early and we get those bad markets or, or ill or anything, that that we're not going to be able to do that. So shock and revelation probably hits my face. Like, oh my God, we're getting money. Like what happened to, I'm going to spend the last dollar. And it just speaks to the, the, the difference when you're in the building years, you'll think in one, one train, but when you get in that mature phase where all of a sudden you're going from building to consuming, your mindset is going to shift. And it's tough when you're in the building phase, it's tough to think about how you're going to be when you're old and consuming. Right. But if you could, if you could go and model this out and see this with your family members, you would know that what I'm saying is accurate. So the big thing there was we just said, I said, Dad, name to me what that is. Like, what are you, what are you doing with your money right now? And so they had a certain amount of money locked up in a GIC prison where they were just siphoning the interest off every year because they knew that that was locked away and that was like, that was safe, transferable money. And what did I tell you my father did for a living? Uh, you didn't see, he just said he, he was in the insurance business, right? So oh, that's right. Insurance insurance for a living. That's right. Yes. Uh, but my father was very much an income replacement guy, sit with the family table. Mm -hmm. He wasn't so much that monster strategist. Right. And so I'm like, well, I'm like, 
what if we could untrap half of all those all that money today so that becomes liquid to you for you to be able to use we'll structure this into an insurance policy joint last to die and uh you know this is you know this will secure the pot of money that you want but along the way if you get bad markets We'll shorten up what you're taking out of the markets and go to this go to this asset over here because it's not market correlated. Mm-hmm. And secondly, um, if you if you get ill, you don't have to sandwich me and my sister. We've got assets here. Yes, we'll get less than what you may have wanted to leave us, possibly, but but you won't have to burden us either. So you still get all the dignity while you're retired and alive, of knowing that you've set aside an estate there for us, tax free, private, immediate, right? Uh, and in addition to that, you've got all this flexibility and options on how we can use your money going forward. And if, if, you, if you have too much life at the end of your money, so if we screw that up and you plan you to live 20 years and you live 22 or 25 or whatever it is, we've also got an asset there that we can, one, just start taking dividends from, two, we can borrow from it, three, it, as, I, as you quote and I know, right, we can take this and leverage it. Life insurance is an interesting tool from a leverage standpoint because it's, I don't know another asset that banks will give you a hundred cents on the dollar of the cash value. Right. Like they won't do that with bonds. They won't do that with commercial real estate. They won't, they won't even do that with personal real estate. So it's, it's, you know, there's throughout all the like things that get said about permanent life insurance. If you structure it correctly and you, and you have the right type of insurance, it is truly one of the greatest assets on your balance sheet, both personal and corporate. Yes. And, you know, a lot of people think um, insurance, they, they, they get confused with a term and a whole life. And then they look at whole life and say, oh, it's way too expensive. I, ca- I can't afford that. And so they don't even look at it. And then they say, well, uh, I'll just buy a term policy. The problem with that, and you and I both know, is that 98.9% of term doesn't pay out. And the most important policy is the one that's in effect the day you die. So a whole life policy, you know, insurance is not for you. It's for your loved ones. Mm. If you have loved ones, the insurance is for them. However, structured properly in a whole life policy, it can be for you. And we can show you how you can be a benefit of your own policy through, like you say, leveraging it later in life for income. Right. So it's really interesting how people kind of have this negative attitude toward life insurance. I mean, you've been in the business now 27 years. What major shifts have you observed in people building wealth? It's definitely not through insurance. No, it's never through. And the insurance isn't like real wealth is the, the majority of the really wealthier that I see. Are, are business owners. So people that have, you know, people that have taken the risk and and they've worked really, really hard. Business yeah. owners work really hard. Like I think people think that you open a business and it just comes boring in and it's just not the case, right? And so, um, you know, people that start businesses, real estate, stock market. And when I say stock market, that that's even a smaller group because it's like, private equity traders. Like it's, it's like people that know the inside of the game. Uh, I, I remember this in your book, you, you got to know the game. Um, and, that, and that's one of the things is people want to play the game, but they don't want to read the rules. Um, you, I'm sure you're familiar with Monopoly. I'm sure you've had oh, yeah. hours of battles with like family members and stuff oh, yeah. playing that. My son <laughs> teaching him real estate. So the interesting <laughs> thing about Monopoly is, I forget whose book it is. It might've been Gladwell's. He talked about the fact that if in the last two decades of Monopoly had a been launched and invented and launched in the last two decades, it would have been a failure because it requires too much attention to rules and time and, and people want instant gratification. And I don't know if you've ever, you, you have a kid that w- would probably have seen this. They came out with an, a Monopoly Junior. And, and I remember buying it for our kids for Christmas and we played it once and I threw it in the garbage. Oh. And the reason why was you could just take people's properties well, it's not so unrealistic with the government today. Yeah. Okay, but <laughs> for most people, it's very unrealistic. Yeah. It just depends on like where. You, so I, I didn't like the lessons that it was. So literally, I, I we had just bought this game, played it once, <laughs> and I was so excited because I thought, oh, I, I loved Monopoly as a kid. Like I, 
my my strategy was I always wanted uh, Baltic and I think it's Mediterranean, the very first two. The first two. The cheapest two. Yeah. They are the quickest ones to get hotels on. Yes. And the, and probabil- and the probability of hitting that <laughs> yes. corner is great. So it was regular high cash flow, right? Yes. Now, I didn't know it as that. I just knew it as my strategy. But later in life, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, look at that, right? So, um, you know, you've got to know the rules to, cert- uh, to, well, to any game that you're going to play. And, and I would say wealth, uh, the majority I see are businesses, real estate, both in development and in ownership, definitely uh, developers. Um, and then, of course, it's like, are you first are you first generation money or are you multi generational money? Right, mm-hmm. like that does have an impact. It has an impact on the way you think, the way you move money. Uh, and I think the the birth of uh, the family offices and the insights that can be found into family office because it was something that was behind a a veil that we couldn't see before, and the way people operate. And the the psychology behind the counseling that goes on with family offices and the way they handle things is very interesting. I think. Well, if if it's new, if it's new money, that money will last about four generations. I mean, just just look at the Vanderbilts, right? They didn't understand how money worked; they just knew how to spend it, right? Right. So if if you're getting into money, depending what generation you you are, it if you're third generation, it's probably just going to last maybe to your child unless you learn how to play the game of money and to learn the play. You got to get down on the field. You got to learn the rules and play the game. You can't be sitting in the stands as a fan. You can't be a cheerleader. You got to understand the rules. If you really want to learn how to play this game, right? What have you seen in, since, you know, you started in 1997, how has financial planning evolved from then till now? I think it's more integrated. And I'm not saying there wasn't, full service integrated planning being done. But I think you used to come in and you were you were an insurance advisor or you were an investment advisor or you were you were a tax advisor. Mm-hmm. And now there there's the move to much more integration. I mean obviously there's a lot more software that's out there. Um and software is software is great, but like I mean once again people want to be advised. I, I don't think the 300 page financial plan that gets printed out of one of those great pieces of software is great, but I, I, I spend a lot of time doing executive memos for people because people want to just dr- drill it down. Tell me the stuff I need to know out of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know that that's really a massive shift or change, but what I would say is nowadays when people come in, there are a lot less one product focus. It's, it's definitely more holistic, uh, you know, I think the term holistic planning is probably overused, but that's that's probably the best term for it. Is it's definitely looking at the person as a whole person. I think the other big one that's come out in a couple of years, which drives me insane, is the term uh, client centric. Mm. Uh, it, now it's like the big buzzword for the last decade. I, I remember when it first came out. Though, I remember sitting at the back of a conference room when uh, I was working at a company, and the senior VP comes out, and he's like. From now on, everything we need we do needs to be client centric. And I remember looking over. I'm like, when wasn't the client at the center? Like, right. look, I never know what we're gonna do when we meet a client until we talk to them. And then I know either we can help them or we can't help them. Like, and if we can't help them, who do I know that can help them? Right. So uh, it's very interesting those those kind of buzzwords de jour. But now I think people are just a lot more thoughtful in making sure that they're working in teams and that they can actually get get the client to where they need to be and, and whatever that is, whether it's money management, tax planning, insurance, I, I think it's just a lot more integrated than what it used to be. Do you think technology has played a major role in people, I think maybe becoming a little bit lazy because there's so many apps now? I mean, I've listened to uh, a few podcasts and then during a break, I hear like, I'll listen to Ramit Sethi's podcast. And in the middle of a break, he'll he'll be advertising this app that will, I guess, you pay for this app to go through and scan all your subscriptions and detects where mm. you could be saving money. I'm like, I'm sorry, but if you just take a look at what you're spending your money on, take a look at your credit card bills or your your bank your bank accounts and see what's going out and look at the subscriptions and cancel them. I don't think you need an app. Do you think people with the, with the evolution of technology is becoming more dependent on it? I, I, 
I think it's almost status status symbols ish. Mm. It's like if I tell, it's not cool for me to say to you, I just went through my credit card re- like uh, ledger, and do you know how many like subscriptions to Amazon or this and that or whatever it is like, you know that I had that it was just spent throwing money out and I'm hardly even using it. And I really wasn't even noticing. It was only like ten bucks here, forty mm-hmm. bucks there. If I tell you though, John, I've got this app that revolutionize your spending. And it'll go through and tell you everything that you're not actually listening to, using, and blah, 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 and losing 10 here, 40 there, whatever. You can do the same thing, but it's not as cool as if I tell you about the app. So, you know, I once again, technology is great if you know what you're looking for out of it. it it's kind of like uh, I'll, I'll drag it back into our industry because somebody asked this question the other day. Somebody said, I'm new in the business. What designations should I consider? And I said, tell me who you're going to serve. Tell me what problems you want to solve. Because there's no point in getting certain designations if you never intend to actually. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I did preface at the end. Listen, ed, I, I have a couple designations which I don't think actually impact what I do for a living. But I was really interested in the subject matter, and that's why I took it. Mm-hmm. So that's perfectly fine. But the other designations that I hold, it's because it actually it actually helps me do my job to a higher level. It actually increases, in my opinion, either my confidence or my influence in helping clients. So that way when they're squaring me up across the table, their accountants are, mm-hmm. they know that I have the leadership level in order to lead them through the problems that they that they have. I think the same thing with app, uh, like technology and apps. Don't just get a piece of software because it's it's funky, it's cool, it's slightly, you know, like it has to serve a purpose, and that purpose always is: does it better the client? Does it move the client forward? Does it move their money forward? Do they, you know, does it give them more at a glance? Does it make it easier? Uh, that's that's all the stuff that I examine when I'm looking at this stuff. But is there more technology? More than ever. Will yeah. there be more next year? Absolutely, there will. Should you get a subscription to it? I don't know. I think now with AI too, people are going to probably rely on AI. Write me a financial plan. <laughs> Be, Chat GPT. <laughs> be, you know, listen, I I, I mean, I, I think it'll do better than nothing. Yeah. Will it be personalized? Like, is Chat GPT all of a sudden, like, you put in a series of inputs of how, how you want things to come out. So that means you as the advisor need to be very clear. So if you're a client thinking about, write me a, uh, write me a financial plan, you've got to be, like, specific. Like, write me a financial plan that ex- executes X, Y, Z on, uh, you know, X, Y, Z income. And this is the, you know. Like you have to know what you want to input on that. And as an advisor, the the major thing that I'm equipped with is the ability to ask questions. And probably the larger of the secret of those two weapons is the ability to actually listen to what you're saying mm-hmm. and, and then take it away and process it and can come back and make sure that I've heard you because that's what advisory is. It's not pitching. It's not coming in with a, a preset idea because it's like, hey, John, like I see the way you dress. I know what you drive. And I, I kind of figure this is how much money you earn. So I think you'd do great with X. Like that's pitching. That's that's terrible. Like mm-hmm. you, you'll end up with a bunch of financial furniture. Like uh, who is it? Uh, Bupin or Nan says you'll end up with a bunch of antique furniture in a modern contemporary home. Mm-hmm. Like does it fit? Maybe not. It does it leave you better than having nothing? Probably. Does it get you ultimately to where you want to go? Probably not. I think the secret sauce is asking asking the right questions. Sure. Because. If, if you're not asking the right questions, you're not going to get the right amount of data from that client to properly structure a financial plan that meets their needs. 100%. Right? I think chat GPT or any other software, is, it's kind of you have to know the right parameters put in. If you're not educated and you don't know what parameters put in, you're not going to get the right financial plan. And I think this comes back to my next question is, what do you think is the most critical financial literacy literacy gaps amongst Canadians today? Oh, that's a that's a tough one because there's there's multiple levels where that, you know, one of the big things. So I sit on a couple boards. One of them is our local advocates board, which is our association, and so a lot of the financial literacy stuff that we talk about there is bringing that down to the high school level, making sure that you know, like at a minimum. You understand how credit works. You know, at a minimum, you understand the importance of budgeting and you know not having too much month at the end of your money. 
Mm -hmm. uh, understanding what different tools are uh, RS RSPs, TFSAs, life insurance, and that you know. So that that's at that low level. Uh, in a family level, it's it's kind of funny. Like we get advisors that they want to get quote unquote leads because their pipelines are a little too thin, right? And I'm like, what if you just like rented a room somewhere and you you started doing like you, you built a binder and you taught people about financial literacy? What's going to happen is people are going to people don't want to execute it themselves most of the time, right? Like, mm -hmm. so like if I come through and my finances get it in better shape and I know how you can lead me, you have a higher probability of converting me, right, into a client um, because you're, you're actually teaching me, which is which is really what the role of the advisor is. We're, we're very good question asks, askers. We're very good listeners, or we should be anyways. Not everybody is. Uh, and, and so, and then from there, it's we're looking at what are all the things you could consider, like, should you consider a trust here? Should you consider a, an estate freeze? Should you consider, uh, you know, do you, at a minimum, do you have a will? Uh, if you have a corporation, do you have multiple wills, right? Do you have power of, power of attorneys? Do you have how, you know, here's this tax liability. Well, here are all the different ways you can pay this tax liability. You don't need insurance to pay tax liability. You just need cash. So what are all the ways that we can come up with cash? And what does it cost you to take illiquid assets and turn those back into cash? in times of duress mm -hmm. with quick succession turnaround, right? Like that comes at a cost. It's tough to take hard assets and turn them liquid. And it's even more tough when the person who put the entire portfolio together isn't the one ripping apart the portfolio. So there's real questions that need to be asked. Um, and we've got to know how all the pieces of the puzzle come together because nothing is inherently good or bad. It's it's all in how it all comes together and solves your your issue. One the one thing that I do notice is that people are so much more focused on saving into RSPs because their accountant told them or their financial advisor or the government says max out your RSPs. And I think the financial literacy is missing where well, what is an RSP? Do you really need an RSP? Should should you be putting into an RSP? Should you be putting into a TFSA? Where should you be directing your money? And I think that there's just so much misinformation out there when it comes to where should you put your money. When it comes to insurance, why do you think the reason that banks don't talk about life insurance with the clients or the governments don't promote whole life insurance to people? So first off, on the RSP front, there's also, like, if you don't own a radio or a TV commercial, think about what think about what going into December to February is like. Oh yeah, it's, it's, all, you, it's all you hear. You, like, it's not even about let's where are we gonna put it in in relation to where your plan is. It's like let's get it in and then we'll figure out where it should go. Let's just put it into money market or whatever, and then when I'm not so busy, we'll figure out where let's it should go. Let's first lock it into the plan yeah, under yeah, yeah, yeah. the RSP umbrella. Let's lock it in there first. Right. Once once you're locked in there, you're screwed. Well, once it's in there, it's in there, right? Like, <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I think Tom, uh, you know, Tom Wall, uh, he, he wrote a book called Permission to Spend Out of the States. He's okay, got a PhD yeah. in, he's got actually a PhD in retirement planning. Uh, and he wrote a great book called Permission to Spend, Spend. And he talks about all the assets. And he's not negative towards any one particular asset. Uh, he just says, like, people have this stuff, basically. So what do we do and how do we maximize the potential of it? So people have RSPs, and, and what they need to evaluate is, does it make sense based on where I am, like, based on how I want to use my money? Um, the, the, in one of the groups that I used to moderate, I was in the other day, and they were taught, somebody said, somebody said, I, I came across this scenario, and it drives me nuts. This woman didn't have any money in RSPs. She had all this money in non-registered. But then the next question that I asked was, well, what does she earn? Like, what does she actually earn for a year? And she earned a very low wage. And I said, well, what would be the real advantage? Like, she's not going to get any great tax advantage from mm -hmm. it. Um, and so, like, we were kind of talking about different strategies that she should use. So there's a barrage of information that comes out during that during that tax planning season. And and I'm still waiting for insurance planning season, right? Because right. <laughs> the, the one thing we know is, like, Nobody can tell you when it's your day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I I had the pleasure of working with uh, a, a doctor, a couple of, sorry, physician, I don't like it when you refer to them as doctors. I, I had the, the pleasure of working with this physician, young physician, under the age of 40, having his first kid. 
super healthy, flew through underwriting. Um, you know, un unfortunately, dead within the year. Mm. It's it's very rare. Like I don't have many stories like that. And if I had a bet, I've insured business owners that are far too short for their for their waistline. Like they are far too short for their weight. Like they should be seven foot two to be in the height weight category. Mm -hmm. Perfect. This guy was absolutely shining example. Runs, lifts, everything's golden. Unfortunately, you know, and and not because of a car accident or something like that, which is what you'd normally would maybe associate. It was just his time. I, I mean, just had his first kid. And, uh, you know, quite frankly, if we had a crystal ball, I'd have told him, don't buy the whole life. Buy the term. You'd be yeah. the one guy that could max out the IRRs on that sucker. Right. Right? <laughs> and nobody buys that way because no, nobody wants to max the IRRs. What he was looking at was, how does this morph and get used throughout my life? And why does this make sense from a tax planning point of view? So... In the States, there's a thing called Life Insurance Awareness Month. We're actually coming close to it. It starts in September. It's a very big initiative in the U.S., but we don't see that here in Canada. Why not? I, it's a very good question. Well, I mean, I know where you want to go with the whole life thing. I mean, just in general, I think promoting life insurance is an important thing because there's so many, like, there's far too many GoFundMes. There's more that I don't know about, and there's some that I see every week. So first off, we need people to start looking at it and, and realizing that you may not be the risk category that you think you are, and you may not get up at tomorrow. And I can't remember if you use this as an example in your in your book. I think you do, but I remember it being taught to me, which is, uh, you know, like if your neighbor walked out on his family in the middle of the night and never came back, what would you think of him? And inevitably, you know, that person gets called every name in the books, and it's like. But you don't have life insurance. So if you passed away, if you walk out the door and never walk back in. The economic impact is still the same. It's still the exact same. same. The difference is he made a choice and you maybe didn't make the same choice, but you left your family in the exact same position. So we need to get people to, to take a look at that and realize you're not immortal. Yeah. And then the second thing is, you know, the rationale as to why not whole life, why, don't, why, why aren't we going to get government promotion on that is that that there's nothing there for them to grab hold of. V Van Mueller yeah. said it perfectly. He said, because they don't make a damn cent off of it. Well, they, That's they, why. They do from premium tax in Canada, but that's a very small like tri trickle of money. Uh, the they make far more on the RSPs. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's like a, it's, it's, the, you know, it's the upcoming balloon payment. They're, they they know they can't. It's, it's a guarantee for them. What's, the, what's that saying? Is it uh, heads, heads I win, tails you lose? Like I win on both sides of the equation here, basically. So if I'm the government, I'm I, I can't lose on that deal. I'm either well, going to take the income in yeah. as you take it out, or you're going to pass away. I'm going to take a massive chunk of it after, of course, the you're spouse. Getting you're getting over. taxed on the harvest, not the seed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Great, <laughs> right. it's a great example. Yeah, right. I would say to clients, "Well, I like RSPs." I said, "Okay, well, let me ask you a question. If if I plant a corn seed." And that corn seed produces one stalk, and that one stalk has two ears of corn on it, and each corn has 500 kernels. Would you want me to tax you on the seed or tax you on the amount of kernels? <laughs> he goes, well, tax me on the seed. I'm like, then stop doing RSPs. Right. Because you don't know what your tax liability is going to be in the future. You don't know what your tax rate is going to be in the future, and you don't know what the tax calculation is going to be in the future, but you do know it's going to be higher, and it has to be higher because the government is out of control in their spending, and the only way that they can somewhat manage the interest on that debt is to increase what? Taxes. So while you're getting a tax deduction, it's not a tax savings, and this is, this is where I think a lot of people miss get misguided they go i saved my tax you didn't save shit you deferred it you deferred it to some unknown time in the future and to some unknown rate what you got was a deduction today on the amount that you contributed right. okay but you're going to pay tax on the whole harvest you're, you're going to pay and the government always wins on this it's the house right so don't pay tax on the harvest you just get taxed on the seed right Right? Didn't make any sense. And this is why I think a lot of the, the governments, they don't promote it. Banks, banks don't promote it because guess how do banks get paid? Assets. They get paid on assets. Well, they do get, they do. So in the. On the insurance side, they're a little like, bit. Yeah. So like there is certain arms that they, they come in and do it, uh, which is great. I mean, you know, they, they, 
But for me, I don't think every case is joint last to die. Like I, uh, sorry, I, I know I'm getting joint last to die is when we take two lives and we turn it into one life on a, yes. an insurance policy. And if you take a look, if you just looked at me, let's say male 49, uh, and I bought an insurance policy, but then I take one and I mash my wife in, I get male, let's say 40. And so my values look so much better because the probability of death payout and, and all this stuff, I get this lift on it. That's great from an IRR perspective, but not from a functionality always. Because number one, if I get divorced, now thankfully I've been with my wife for a very long time, we have a good relationship, but it's funny, I'll say this to people, like divorce at my age category is 50%. Yeah. Like, and younger, and I'm seeing joint last, I quotes younger. And the rationale I get from people is, but they're a good family. And I'm like, you know, good families get divorced too. I don't know if people like, got divorced after 35, 40 years yeah. got divorced. So, well, that's, so that's great divorce. Great divorce is, is, is another thing to be worried about too, because especially if you're a business owner, your wife might like you for three hours a day, but she might not like you for 18. Like right. it's just the reality. Try retiring. <laughs> hey, COVID put a lot of stress tests. Like oh, divorce yeah. lawyers got very, mediators got very busy after yes, COVID. So yes. the reason why I say watch joint lasted eyes, it, yes, it looks great on paper from a return, yeah. but if there's any chance at all inkling in your mind that anything could happen to your relationship splitting these things is a nightmare and worse is what people think is well ultimately the benefits for the kids so i'll just hang on to it and we'll just settle other assets out to her and we'll just equalize and it'll be fine because i'll have the whole life policy and it's growing and i like the whole life policy and that and it's like okay great so you pass away who's the policy go to what will go to my kids great however there's no spousal rollover of that policy, so it becomes taxable at that point. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, what looks great on paper, or if it's corporately owned, great, your wife, there's no spousal rollover once again, so it becomes taxable at that point. So buyer beware, joint last and I can be great, but single life, even though it might look a little less shiny in the return of rate of return section, it is very, very functional. Well, just, just take a look at myself and my wife. My wife... She has a very small business. Um, I am the 99.9% .9 income earner. Why would I get a joint last to die policy if I die? She still has to make those premiums. How is she going to make those premiums? Because the income stopped. Right. She needs the income. I'm the guy that brings in the income. So it's more likely it's better structured if I do a single life on me that it gets paid out to her, premium stop, cancel, she gets the payout, and she can invest it or do what she wants for the rest of her life. Right. Didn't make sense to insure someone who doesn't bring the income, because really when I, when I look at life insurance, I look at one life insurance as one, let's look at number one, income replacement. Let's protect the income. That's number one. Every family should protect the income. Number two, I look at post-mortem tax planning. What's that tax bill going to look like? You, you talked about hard assets and maybe having to go into a fire sale. What if, what if you can't liquidate assets at that time, huh. right? At least the thing with life insurance is it's going to pay out in like 30 days or less than 30 days. You have that money to satisfy a lot of the needs of Revenue Canada or any other tax bills or any, any other shareholders, probably if it's a corporately owned. It's, it's, I, I, like I said, I always like life insurance has got to be the heart of every financial plan. And I think there's not too many people that really understand how it really works. Yeah. And, and, and listen, uh, if we're doing tax planning for end of life for a couple and we're looking at liquidity, joint last that I can make great sense yeah. there. The other one I like is uh, for income is f I, I just had this conversation on the drive in with someone. We're working with an, uh, an older Canadian a lot of money in GICs. Right now, annuity rates are, are, are the best I've seen oh, in, yeah. in almost 20 years. Yeah. And uh, so what we're looking at is a portion of their fixed income portfolio that's coming open. And what we're looking at is saying, can we get a stronger income flow? So GIC equivalent, greater than what they can get in the marketplace, leveled out for life. We'll back it with a life insurance policy. So we'll buy an annuity, back it with a life insurance policy. So that way it does what they want because they're they're buying a GIC so that way the capital goes back to their family. 
So we put that capital in the form of insurance, tax-free, private, immediate, right? Done, out of the way. Government gets none of that. And the annuity net, after it pays for the insurance, gives them a stronger stream of income than what they could have gotten GICs. We call it a back-to-back -back annuity. And right now, for the next foreseeable future, while annuity rates are still good, it is a great market for GIC grandma and grandpas out there that they, they may not even like insurance. I don't even care if you like insurance, but you like cash flow. And you don't do it for all the portfolio. So you notice I said a percentage. So I, I'd say 25 to 30% of the portfolio max because they still need liquidity. Because if something happens to them, they still need to have access to cash. So increase part, part of the portfolio and reduce all the risk and take away all the estate risk. Gorgeous. How can someone use life insurance as a wealth building tool? Uh, once again, I mean, your money's, you know this, your money's got to reside somewhere. Um, and insurance is not an investment, so let's make it's that not clear. An it's not an investment, it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a storehouse, right? Like it's it's a place where you store your money. Yeah. The way products are designed today, the, the one of my mentors and friends, Dennis Capone Senior, always used to say the water is two feet deep. And a lot of products today, the water is two feet deep. And what that means is, by year three, let's say I'm doing a hundred thousand dollar deposit. Notice I said deposit, not premium, not cost, because when I buy a whole life, it's a deposit. The money does show up on my balance sheet, right? Yeah. For the first two years in a lot of products, I'm underwater. By the third year, I put 100 grand in the front end. It's growing by 100 grand or greater by the end of year three, typically. By year five, they typically break even. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I look at that, even if I went out to year four and I'm not broken even, it's probably not as ugly as maybe a bad weekend in Vegas. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like I'm really not out any money. So what can I do with that money once it's in there? Well, I've got liquidity access and control to that money. So I can leverage that over and over again. And once again, it's so like this, I know you mentioned this in your book, and this is something that gets mentioned a lot is people will say, but I'm borrowing my money. You're not borrowing your money. No. You're taking a lien against your contract. And it's the par fund that's actually lending that out. And so the interest that gets paid actually goes back to the par fund. And if you're buying in a mutual cooperative or fraternal, you actually own the par fund because you own the company. So, uh, you know, you're, you're taking that money out and you're taking it out if you can get better than what you're borrowing at, right? So like, once again, you gotta know the rules. This works really well for people that understand the deal that they're going into. If you're putting money in and pulling it out and putting it into some risk that you don't really understand, be it stock market-based, be it, you know, a limited partnership or whatever you're going into, that's gambling. Remember that, right? And you would never borrow money. You never go borrow a hundred grand out of your line of credit to go to Vegas. That's a really dumb move. But people do it all the time with their money because they everybody has a, they have optimism bias. They think it'll happen to everybody else, but mm -hmm. not to them. Mm -hmm. And so, if you know that you can make money, you could borrow money at seven, but you were going to get fifteen on your money. Why wouldn't you do that? Because you still have your money growing inside your policy. Yes. So, I think it's a great way to store up wealth, it turns into instant cash, tax-free, private, immediate, if something happens to you. But it's a way that you can leverage your money over and over again and grow your wealth. But once again, you've got to be working with some, you've got to be in either the right mastermind or working with the right people where you can learn those rules. Because if not, you got a lot of books to read, you got a lot of things to study because, and, and it's taken me over 20 years. It's taken you over 20 years. 25 years. Right? Like, so it's, it, you can't do it part time. Like, and I'm still learning. I, I, I learn stuff every day. <laughs> every day. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the beautiful thing about life and business, right? Is if you're open, you'll learn stuff every day. Yeah. So, you, you know, you want to leverage the right people and people that, the other thing too is make sure that, that they're in the, uh, that you're taking advice from people that are at your level or above your level. Everybody below your level, you know, critics and everybody always have great advice. They, they'll never implement any of it themselves and they never make any wealth on it. Mm -hmm. So make sure that you're, you're being led by somebody that, you know, has the ability to lead you, has the team around them to lead you. And who actually does it themselves. That'd be nice. It would be right? nice. I know. I've got, I've got three policies. I've got three policies myself and I have one of my sons. I've, I, I, I'm the owner of four policies. And I know guys like Jason Lowe, who's got like 87 yeah. policies. Like he's crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's on the extreme. But you yeah. know, what a cool but he believes in it. What a cool story, right? Created a family bank. Listen, you you can think what, like, I don't care. I know I hear different sides of the tale from people. 
I don't think that guy's losing one ounce of sleep. No. If you don't like the way he does things or says things. And if you want to see somebody that's followed, like that's that's taking their own medicine, there's a guy that's becoming t- your own banker. Hey, else than listen, that, yeah, he, he's 84 policies, a lot of cash, and that's led to a lot of companies. Uh, you know, so you yeah. you can say whatever you want. I I guarantee you that he's not losing one ounce of sleep. On I think it. he said he's up to about a million dollars a year in deposits. Yeah, right I think now. I I think I remember that. Yeah, that's, yeah. I had, I had Jason on my podcast a while. I was really really informative. I love talking with that guy. Yeah, you know what? He, he's uh, he's articulate. He's excited about life, uh, and he's very intentional in what he's doing. Yes, you got to appreciate that. That's there's not there's not much of that. Now I will tell you, I have counseled people on policies I do not own myself. I do not have a couple million dollar IFA on my own. So I own the things I own because they make sense within my financial life. I've counseled people on that because we've gotten very clear as to what they're trying to accomplish. And we've worked within their teams and identified that this works and any of the tax measures. So like anything with interest deductibility and whatnot, we've, we've made sure that we're using all the proper rates and stuff. So I'm not saying that you have to own everything that you sell, but you have to have a good framework and a very good process as to why you would recommend things for the person you're sitting in front of. Absolutely. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We're about running out of time. I got a couple more questions for you. And I think this is a really important one. Do you think parents should talk about money with their children? Because I remember when I was a child, my parents, it was like taboo to discuss money at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and for what reason? I don't know. Uh, while my father, probably because we never had any, <laughs> from, from one, I grew up poor. Um, and I think the topic of money created a lot of friction because because we didn't have any money, it caused fights. Right. But do you think parents should talk about money with their children, even at a young age? I do. I, I mean, we talked about the financial literacy in schools. I think it's important to be talking about that with your kids. Uh, I have older kids, so... Uh, my kids are all over the age of 20. Uh, it's really rather funny. Uh, they're all pretty good savers, but my eldest daughter is probably the most diligent saver I've ever seen. If her accounts drop below uh, 20 grand, she starts panicking. Like So like they went away uh, to Europe and some things happened and it caused her to have to dip in and cost her a little bit more than what she anticipated. And like, I, like the sheer panic on her face to have to go below 20 grand is crazy. <laughs> so... Uh, I can guarantee you, I did not grow up that way. Uh, I got married very young and had kids young. So like, that, you know, the idea of having 20 grand in your bank seems like a, a pipe dream to me. But you know what? It's important that that they understand money, that they respect money. Uh, I think it's important that they understand risk. I think it's, imp- I've been very fortunate. I've had two of my kids uh, hire coaches in the various fields that they're in. Mm. Uh, one of them resulted in her leaving teaching and going, uh, becoming an associate underwriter at a U.S. general insurance company. Um, I think it's important that they not only learn the rules of money, but they learn the value of investing in themselves. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I was the same as you. Like there was things that were taught to us, but not really a blueprint that was kind of laid out. Where it's kind of funny, like they'll come home and they'll be like, "Oh, I'm thinking about doing this," and I'm like, "Hey." I'm thinking you should be thinking of your TF or your uh, what is it? Is that what's that uh, tax free home buyer? What, what's the new one? FHSA or something? Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a home buying plan, tax free yeah. home buying plan. So, yeah. like, like I think that you know, from a government per- plan perspective, that's actually a pretty good government plan from the standpoint of put money in, you get a deduction, you can draw it out tax free for your first house. This is a big concern for kids. Uh, so my daughter was saying, "Oh, should I put money into an RSP?" I'm like, "Heck no." And she's like, why? And I go, look, why when you you know you want to pull it out for a house, put it in the thing that's not going to penalize you right. or that you don't have to pay it back. Like, because it, I love the idea of you being scheduled to pay it back, but you don't know what your cash flows are going to be like when you buy a house. So you might need a little wiggle room here. So, you know, I, I, I just, I love the fact that they'll come back and they'll talk with us and they'll talk openly and, and the fact that they are good savers uh, and that they are thinking of investing in themselves and in the, and, and where they want to put their money and, uh, I think we need more of that. Uh, by the way, there was an example in your, you used it with golf. My dad did a, you know, would you rather me pay you $10,000 a month for one month? Or would you rather me give you a penny and double it every day? And like, as you point out in your book, the the last day is worth like just an, an obscene amount of money. And, uh, you know, so I think my father was trying to do it, 
but like, I, I think he thought his kid was a lot smarter than what he was. <laughs> like, cause like, I was like, that's a great example, dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't know what I'd do with that example. But, uh, now I think we talk about things like, Hey, write yourself a budget. Like, Hey, what's, you know, I know you want to do this. Where are you at financially on that? And, uh, we've talked about credit. So my kids have cards. Uh, I first started with, uh, I think they were first started with visas. They learned how to control the visa. Then they went to MasterCard just to just to start creating their credit in different yep. sources. Yep. Uh, but they're great because they they pay their balances off monthly. That's good. I, I didn't do that. No, 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 no. I paid way too much money away to people. I transferred a lot of money away <laughs> to people. If I could get some of that back, John, if I could have met you early enough. Mind you, I was broke as a joke back then. But, uh, yeah. you know, it's important that they understand these rules. I, I've got my son reading my book. Mm. You know, because I... I make him read when, when he's with me, um, especially weekends. It's before you do any gaming, number one, you have to read for an hour. Number two, you have to practice your piano for 30 minutes. Then when your bed's made and everything's done, then you can sit down and you can have fun. Yeah. So he, he finished reading one of his books. And I said, well, why don't you go grab one of my books? Dad, your books are boring. I said, how about you read the book that I just wrote? He goes, well, that'd be boring. I said, let me tell you something. You read my book, you will understand more about money than three quarters of this country. Okay? You're not going to learn this stuff in school. So go read my book. He's on like page 75, and I quiz him. Yeah. And he's telling me stuff that he's, he's, he's learning. And so now when he cuts the grass, I pay him 20 bucks. If he has to trim, I pay him another 10 bucks. He makes 30 bucks. Right away, he goes, okay, so what you're saying, I've got $15 to spend? I'm like, yeah. Because he knows I'm taking 50%. Mm -hmm. He just had his 13th birthday on Saturday. He got a bunch of money. I took 50%. It's, it's going into your savings. I'm going to teach you how to save. He's 13. He knows how to save. He saves 50%. Yeah. So the stuff that he's now learning in my book, I said, you will be so much more wiser. You'll know more than half this country about money. Yeah, yeah. Right? So I think it's really important. Last question. If you can go back to your younger self, what advice would you give him? So first off, I just want to ask you on your son, because if not, I'm going to buy him uh, this book. Do you have the book, uh, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? No. Okay. I'm going to buy him that book. Okay. Okay. I'll drop it off to you. Thank it's, you. It's the first book I bought my son. And it's the idea of, uh, in, in one of the things I attached to early on with that was, it was me, Inc. So thinking of yourself as a business. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a small book, maybe a hundred pages of reading in a night. Great book. I'll, I'll make sure that we, Great. we hook that up. Thanks. Uh, if I could go back to my younger self, uh, I'll be honest. Um, I, I, I'm good with money now. Uh, but I wish that I, I wish I, I didn't, I wish I wasn't such a convincing salesperson back then. And I wish I had a saved something. Well, you understand the game now. Uh, you know, I get it. I get it. Right. Yeah. But if I could like, once again, I'm taking yeah. what I know yeah. and going back, uh, then, I would, even if it was, as you said in your book, yeah. even if it was just $10, because I think yeah. it's something that, uh, I think it's something that you just got to start doing. Yeah, and, exactly. I, and I agree. Like, I mean, I've seen lifestyle go up. I have three kids. So as my income rose, like I was getting caught up on all the debt that I uh, like acquired early. Right. So yeah. I, I got all that caught up and we're not in a bad position at all. But uh, I just look at it and I'm like, geez, you know, like if I could go back and start it earlier. So I, so I tell the kids all the time, like, like, don't hold off on this. Like, you need rainy day accounts. You need to be taking some risk on some stuff. You need to understand where you're putting your money. And my big thing is just bank on yourself. Like, I'd rather see you invest. Like, my son right now has just started out in real estate. He's getting the crack kick, crap kicked out of him, uh, cold calling. Yeah, I love it every day. I just smile because I'm like, you know what? I could do it. If you survive this, you will never have a problem making money. You will never have a problem adding value into people's life because until you can add value, you will not make any money. Well, he's hearing a lot of no's too. Yeah, it's great. You got to you got to you got to know how to accept the no's. Yeah, yeah. So cool. Uh, you know, I would just do that, and if I could add one more, uh, it's funny. I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I said um, there was a system out there, and I said, you know, I looked at that system, and I said, if I could go back twenty years ago. But I could take everything that I know today. I would yeah. probably go into that system because I'm like, I would be able to offer so much value in that system. Um, but when I look back, I go, the realistic thing is 20 years ago, I didn't know what, I, what, I, what I've been exposed to. And it's just really the at-bats, right? Like I've just had more at-bats than more people, most people, because 
I've worked with so many great advisors in the city that have brought me out to see clients. And so I've just, I've just been in more situations than most people have. And uh, so I not only have the, the technical from the, from the studies, but I have a lot of at bats in front of clients and helping them figure things out. And uh, so I think, you know, just, just keep taking, if I had to say something, you just keep taking the swings, keep, keep taking the swings, keep taking the punches in the face in the end, you don't know how it's going to come together, but it, but it somehow comes together. Yeah. yeah. Brent, this has been great. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Folks, you heard Brent talk about my book many times throughout the conversation. My book, Wealth Without Wall Street, Taking Back Control of Your Money and Rigged Financial System, is out on Amazon. It's in chapters. Grab it. This is the stuff that you're not going to learn in school. If you like this episode, please like it, subscribe, and share with your friends. That's all for today. Take care of your wealth and your health.